Welcome. So, how's Garden Fund going for you so far? Awesome. Uh, so, how many people have been to one of my talks before? All right. And how many have never been? Okay, good. I can use little jokes. Right. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, today we'll be talking about unsolved codes. One of my favorites is cryptos, and I've already spoken just about cryptos here at DragonCon a couple times. So, here I'm going to kind of go through it really fast and also share some other unsolved codes here. So, um, also, new book just came out in September. It's my fourth book. Um, also, I'm so glad to be back. Yeah, I've been five years since I've been Dragon Con because of the pandemic. Um, when I tried to use my credit card for the hotel, everything was rejected because they said, We don't know your credit cards ever been used in Atlanta. It hasn't been used for five years. So I had to reactivate all of my credit cards. I'm like, wow, it's only been five years. Okay, but I'm back. So, um, fourth book. I co-wrote it with uh, Klaus Schmeh, who is a big crypto blogger in Germany. And um, we did a British version. And then when it was released, which was on December 10th, 2020, not this one, but the other one was released December 10th, 2020. And one of the big things we said in it was uh, about unsolved codes. And one of them was the Zodiac Killer Cipher, a big un unsolved cipher. December 11th, one of our colleagues, David Arantak, contacted me and said, we just cracked the Zodiac. You're going to have to rewrite the book. So, <laughs> so we started rewriting the book. And so this is the new expanded edition, which came out in 2023, which talks about the cracked Zodiac Cipher. And also, I'm going to be giving a talk here at DragonCon on Monday about the Zodiac Cipher and how it was cracked. Um, I'll also be talking about another set of famous codes by Mary, Queen of Scots, that you may have seen in the news that were just discovered, uh, and because they were misfiled in the French National Library under Italian ciphers, because there was nothing on it. It was just a big piece of paper, or many pieces of paper that just had squiggles on it, and there was no from, to, date, anything like that. But uh, some of my colleagues were going through, and they kind of go page by page looking for anything that's encrypted, and they found this. They tried decrypting it in Italian and didn't work. Tried other languages, tried French. It worked. And they kept going in and they saw that it was written by a woman because the, the verbs were, were by a woman and she was talking about her son. And then they were like, oh my God, these are by Mary Scots. And they had found over 50 letters by her uh, that had been completely misfiled. It was like the biggest discovery in over 100 years. So, any, so anyway, I'll be talking more about that on Monday. So, um, so here are some of the ciphers we'll be talking about. And we'll start with my favorite, which is cryptos. And this is in the United States, over there on the East Coast in Langley, Virginia. It, this is the CIA headquarters. You may have seen it in Tom Clancy movies where they go, CIA, dun, 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 overhead view. So yeah, this is the, um, on the right-hand side is the original headquarters building. On the left-hand side is the new headquarters building, the building with the white kind of UFO shaped roof in the middle, that's the cafeteria. <laughs> and looking out the left side of the cafeteria there, there is a big green area. And there were um, sculptures to be placed in that area. And the artist that they hired, a man named Jim Sanborn, decided to create a sculpture with the theme of encryption. And he called it cryptos, which is Greek for the word hidden. Here it is, it's about 12 feet tall, 20 feet long. It's got about 1,800 characters carved through it, so you can see through it, so you can see on the other side there. And um, it was commissioned in 88, dedicated in, in 1990. And um, these ciphers were designed by a man named Ed Scheidt, who was in the process of retiring. He was the head of the CIA. They said he was the head of the CIA Cryptographic Center. There is no CIA Cryptographic Center. So I asked him since then, like, which department do I put you with? He says, just put CIA. So that's very CIA, very spooky. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, at the top, there's the four sections. We call them K1 through K4. Um, the, I won't go into the details about how they're put together, but I'll say that the first one is between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. 
and the word illusion you may see there is misspelled. It's got a Q in there, but it's, I've talked to Sanborn and he saw, it says it's deliberate, but it's not what it is that's so important, it's where it is, it's the orientation or positioning. Then part two says it was totally invisible. How is that possible? They use the Earth's magnetic field. I'm doing this with memory because I can't see it. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location. Can you this move your mic, please? Move what? your mic. Move your mic. Yeah, because you moved away from the mic. Okay. It was totally invisible. How is that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere. Who knows the exact location? Only WW. This is his last message. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. That's layer 2. And any of you, is anybody here a geocacher? Okay, so those of you that are captured know that we're at 6.5 seconds north, a tenth of a second of latitude is a very specific location, about 10 feet across. So there was some speculation that it was pointing to the location of Kryptos itself, but no, it's pointing to an area about 100 feet southeast of it. Um, and then um, layer two is also something, there was a typo in this culture. And then when Sandboard revealed what the type was at the very end, it said X layer two. We thought it said ID by Lewis, but it's layer two. Not that, that makes it so much more understandable. And then uh, part three, slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of debris, a passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner, and then widening the hole a little. I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently the details of the room within emerged from the mist. Can you see anything? And some of you may know that that is a paraphrased extract from the diary of Howard Carter on November 26, 1922, the day that he discovered King Tut's tomb. And then there is part four, unsolved. You don't know what it says. 97 letters there at the very bottom. And uh, now Sanborn has given us a few clues about it. In uh, 2010, he told us that at the 64th position there is the word Berlin, which made international news, especially in Germany. And then we still didn't solve it. So then four years later, he gave us another clue, which is right after Berlin is the word clock. So there was a flurry of looking around at Berlin clocks. There's a lot of very uh, big, fascinating clocks in Berlin. Still didn't solve it. So then in February 2020, he told us about the word Northeast. Still didn't solve it. Then the pandemic started, and so he kind of wanted to uh, uh, kind of spice things up. And so he released another clue, which is the word East there. So now we have a big chunk of the plain text of what we call K4. Still don't know what the rest of it says. It's kind of embarrassing. But if anyone here wants to work on it, we have, uh, I have a big website on it, eddielongi.com slash cryptos. Uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're open to all kinds of ideas. Uh, cryptos is also a big part of the book by Dan Brown called The Lost Symbol, which is the sequel to The Da Vinci Code. It takes place in Washington, D.C., and it features cryptos and Freemasons as a big part of the book and um oops. okay and also in the book there is a character named nola k which is named after me and you take the, the letters of nola k and you unscramble them that's the long i was really surprised very, very flattered that he did that so why hasn't k4 been solved yet well it's short 97 characters so it's very difficult to find patterns in something that small it's possible that we need to be at CIA to solve it. It was never intended as a public challenge. Um, we may have missed something. We might have been misdirected. Maybe when he said Berlin and clock, maybe there is no Berlin and clock. I don't know. And maybe he just messed it up because he has made other mistakes in other sculptures. But he has insisted no, that he's checked it and rechecked it. And he's sure it's done right. 
So that's all I'm going to say about cryptos, that it's still an unsolved crypto mystery. Next, I will go to something that's less known. It's called the DeVosmus cryptogram. So we're going to go back to New York State and uh, in Essex County in the late 1800s, a man arrived, a newcomer to Essex County. His name's Henry DeVosmus. It's actually a self-portrait. And he was born in 1836. And he immediately started courting a young widow in the area. And they got married very quickly. Now, this was not his first wedding. It was actually his third wedding. He'd been married twice before. And his wives had both died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. Uh, but he married Elizabeth. And then a few months after they were married, yeah, she died. Um, not blood and storage. <laughs> And um, so, of course, he was the prime suspect, and he was uh, immediately arrested. And yeah, he was <laughs> um, and uh, while he was in prison, he knew a lot. He was a wonderful artist, and he also was creating these encrypted messages. So he did this, then the trial started in January, and he was found guilty on April 16th. And then he knew he was going to be hanged. So an interesting thing here is he sold his body before he was killed. He sold his body to a local physician so that he would have enough money to buy a nice suit in which to be hanged. So he was hanged in a very nice suit. And then his uh, skeleton was then shown around to various uh, schools and used for various education purposes. And the skull is currently in the museum at the, at the Adirondack History Museum. And the rope, the hangman's rope, is there as well. There's also other possessions of his at the time. So was he guilty? Probably. I mean, did he murder his first two wives too? And who was he? Because during the trial at some point, he said he wasn't really Henry DeVos. He was someone else. He didn't really say who. And, um, and then there were all these cryptograms he created. Now, he spoke several languages. He was very educated. Uh, and again, he was a wonderful artist. And he wrote these things that looked like encrypted messages. In fact, this one had a certain number of lines. And then also there, he wrote a poem with the same number of lines that was in Greek. So maybe one can be decrypted into the other, but we haven't had any luck with this. Uh, but it sort of looks like it should be able to. Um, Klaus has spent a lot of time on it, but hasn't had any luck. So, until now, this is still an unsolved crypto mystery. All right, now we're going to another one. I love this one. It's the pigeon message. So this is um, in Surrey in the early 1980s. A man was cleaning his chimney, and he found the remains of a carrier pigeon. And this was a carrier pigeon from World War II. And this came to public attention in 2012. And the pigeon still had a little capsule in its leg with a message in it, and it was an encrypted message. All right, now pigeons were used a lot in World War II. There were hundreds of thousands that were used. So they even had a special metal that was created for pigeons. Like if a pigeon was injured and still got to its destination, there was the, the Dickin Medal, and it was awarded to pigeons, and there was some dogs and uh, horses and even cats that received this medal. Now, here's the actual message, a copy of the message that was in the capsule. That it was a red capsule like this means that it was probably either the British Army or the uh, U.S. forces used red capsules as well. And that was sent to X02. This was the code we know now for what was RAF, Royal Air Force, Bomber Command, and High Wingham. And then in different handwriting, lower down on the message, we have the pigeon identifiers. We know that there were two copies of this message that was sent. And we can go through and kind of cover what the different parts say here. So N U R P, NERP, means the National Union of Racing Pigeons. So they used pigeons that were already being raised to be fast pigeons. And they were raised in different sections around England. And the, uh, uh, the, the bands around the pigeons' legs had certain numbers. And the first 
two digits were the year that that pigeon was banded. In this case, we had a 1940 and 1937. And then probably where the pigeons had been banded. So TW maybe meant Twickenham, might have been Tunbridge Wells, uh, and uh, DK, uh, yeah, we'll get it on the next slide. And then the next number would be of the pigeons that were banded in those locations. That was the number of that particular pigeon. So now we have Surrey, where it was found. Down at the bottom, we have Normandy, which is where D-Day was taking place, June 6, 1944. Uh, you have High Wycombe, and then Bletchley Park, which was the main code-breaking section. We don't think the pigeon was on its way to Bletchley Park. We think it was on its way to High Wycombe. Then we have the TW and DK. So TW was probably either Twickenham or Tunbridge Wells, and DK of oh, Dorking was another place that pigeons were being raised. So we have this message again, probably sent on D Day. So we have here at the end of it the sixth, the day of the month. And at the very bottom left, we have the time that the form was filled in, and then also the time that the message was created. So someone was filling in the form, they had a plain text message, and they were going from that plain text message and they had to encrypt it, and then they were copying it from there onto this form. So there is a chance for some errors going through this process. The number of copies that were sent were two. All right, and as I said, different handwriting, probably by someone from France. So you, you see at the bottom where it says libre, that would be libre, so the, the pigeon was freed at, at that time. So probably whoever wrote the message did not bring their own pigeons. Some of them did. But in this case, they probably encrypted the message and then handed it off to someone that was in the French resistance. And then that person put it into the capsule and sent it along. And the person that did send it, well, is someone by W. Stott Sargent. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion online about what that means. The actual message was a little crumpled, so it might have been double T at the end of Stott, it might have been Stitt. Um, so possibly it was this Sergeant William Stott. It's a very common name. There were hundreds of people with the name Stott. Um, but possibly William Stott who was a paratrooper who parachuted into Normandy on a reconnaissance mission. And then if we look at the message itself, another interesting thing about it is the 27 there means that there were 27 groups of five characters. This is common with messages. They put them into groups of five. And also we'll notice that the group A-O-A-K-N appears twice, once at the beginning of the message and once at the end. So that may be also a clue for what type of system was used. So which system was used? Uh, there's lots that could be there. Maybe there's double transposition. Maybe it used a code book. Maybe there was a machine uh, that they found. Maybe it was a one-time pad. Um, there, some of these machines on the far right, this is very large. It would be a, a big machine. And the one in the middle is something you could actually hold in your hand and operate with your thumb. So again, was it something that was brought in? Was it something that they used in France? We don't know. So unsolved crypto mystery. The cigarette case. Now, if anyone here knows uh, German, this will be especially interesting. So this was uh, a picture of this was sent to us by someone saying that it was from his family in the area of Germany called Thuringia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. All right. And we know it's from 1909 because there is a date on it. And there's a few letters carved into it, the AS initials. And then inside the cigarette case, we have these letters. And at the very bottom, it says 24-12-1909. They, they gave their presents on, on Christmas Eve there. So Christmas Eve, 1909. And that's what we know. In that message, does it say, uh, was it, uh, Frohe uh, Weihnachten, Merry Christmas, is that in there? Maybe, maybe not. Um, can it be read from left to right, right to left, top to bottom? Maybe the cigarettes need to be in the case in order for the message to be read. Um, we don't know. Maybe you need to have cigarettes that go up to, that like, uh, if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Okay. Okay, so maybe the cigarettes need to go up to where you have that 
uh, like an Egyptian, three verticals and a slash. Maybe you need to have cigarettes covering everything below that. We don't know. So this remains uh, an unsolved message. It looks simple, but no, have the name of solved. Now the Dorabella cryptogram. This is relatively famous because it was written by Edward Eldon Moser, who you may have heard uh, him, he, he uh, composed Pomp and Circumstance, which you hear at every graduation ceremony. And he was very interested in codes. So he was from uh, Worcester. Um, and he had a big interest in puzzles. And he also wrote something called the Enigma Variations, where each variation was intended to be dedicated or refer to one of the people in his life, his wife, his friends, and others. And one of those people, number 10, this was the Dorabella variation. And Dorabella, this was meant to be Dora Penny. She was uh, one of the young women who was in his entourage. Uh, she uh, uh, accompanied him and observed him as he was composing music. And later on in her life, she wrote an autobiography, which she called Edward Elgar, Memories of a Variation. And in this autobiography, she included this note. And she said that it had been received at one point when uh, Elgar's family uh, had stayed with her family. And then when his wife, Alice, was writing a thank you note to them, he included this note with that thank you message, specifically to Dora, um, an encrypted message. But she was never able to decrypt it. And she asked him about it at one point, and she, apparently he replied that he was surprised with all they had talked about that, he, that she was not able to decrypt it. So she included it in her autobiography and said, I would appreciate if someone maybe could decrypt this. So tell me what it says. No one's been able to use it. So it's been well over 100 years now. There are tons of interest in this in the crypto community. In fact, people say, I've solved it probably about every year or so. So we kind of number these like comments, like 2024 one on the board bill side for 2024 on the doorbell cipher. In fact, there's one that's bubbling up right now. There's a guy who said, I solved it, but I'm not going to tell you what it says. Well, you don't really get credit for solving it unless you tell us what it says. He says, well, I'm going to make a presentation to the Elgar Society. Okay, fine. And then you're going to tell us what it says. He says, well, no, I'm going to write a book about it first. And then you get to buy the book to find out what it says. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So we'll see. He says he's going to do a breath relief and all that. My guess is he doesn't have it, but who knows? Uh, now, Elgar did use that squiggle system, and we found it in others of his notes. But when we try to uh, transcribe what the doorbell cipher is, what the doorbell ciphers with those notes, we, we don't really get anything intelligible. Here's the uh, example of what's the entire alphabet, A through Z. But when we try to transcribe it, we don't really get anything intelligible. Now, maybe that is called super encryption, so you have to do one method and then you have to do another method on top of that, maybe. Um, we've tried to transcribe it in other ways as well, where you start at the beginning and you just say the first one is going to be an A, the second is going to be a B, and so forth. It's one way to change squiggles into letters that our brains can understand. I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. Um, but we haven't been able to find anything there. We've done letter frequencies. The most common character there, granted it's a very short message, is does appear there about 12% of the time, which could be an E. If, if you take the English language and you take Moby Dick or you take some, some book and you count all the letters in it, the E is going to show up about 12% of the time. So I haven't come up with any. Uh, we've looked at other things. Can we guess words? Well, it's difficult. It doesn't have any spaces. 
Um, hill climbing is a, a hot method with computers, but it, it's, it says, yes, I solved it, but we don't really get anything intelligible like, P.S. now droop beige weeds set in it, pure idiocy, one entire bed. It, just, it doesn't sound like a message that he would send. So why do these methods fail? Well, maybe it's not a letter substitution. Maybe it's something else. I mean, Morse code would be a letter substitution. Maybe it's meant to be musical notes. Those are, um, maybe it has mistakes in it. Maybe it was a hoax. But why would he send a message that was a hoax to this young woman who was in, in his entourage? It doesn't, this doesn't make a lot of sense. It wasn't the kind of thing that he'd do. Um, maybe the plain text is unusual, like, if you take this sentence, do you go to London tomorrow? It would be very difficult to decrypt because it doesn't have any ease in it. And so if you're using the general methods you would use for cryptanalysis, it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't parse. It wouldn't parse. So doorbell cipher, unsolved, put to a mystery. Now the furlong postcard. Definitely not a super well-known one, but a very intriguing one. Of all the encrypted postcards and things that we found, this is the oldest of them. And these are newer postcards, generally from about 1880s to 1910s or so. There were lots of encrypted postcards. It was just a really hot thing to do in, in Victorian England. People, especially if they were recording, weren't allowed to send messages to each other, or if they were, it was going through all the hands of everyone in the, in the household. And so people would encrypt things, so it would be a hidden message if they're sending it to their lover. Um, they also did a lot of encrypted classified ads. But generally, the messages used very simple codes, simple substitution ciphers. Others, um, for example, I'll if you look at this for a moment. What does this say? You knew, darling, right. Not a particularly difficult code here on the postcard. Um, uh, this one is a little more difficult. It's got all these numbers on it. Uh, and it's, it's uh, each letter of the alphabet is connected to a specific number, and then it goes from right to left instead of left to right. But again, it's not a difficult cipher. And the kind of message, you know, baby, I wanted to talk to you so bad. Uh, I'm so sorry you did not have time. So it, again, just a romantic messages of these kinds. And but then there's this one, which was sent from a brother to a sister. He was the owner of a football club or a football team uh, in uh, in Luton, and this was the message that he wrote. He signed it there, George Furlong. And it was clear the way he wrote it that he was fluent in this system. He wasn't writing each character with difficulty. It was something that it looked like he'd written several of these, but we've never seen this kind of code before. And we've asked the person who gave it to us, his great grandson, if there's anything else in the attic that, that uses these kind of messages. Nothing. He says that was the only thing he saw. Also, another odd thing about it is that the letters are not all in a single line. You have little bits and pieces at the tops of lines. And it's difficult to do frequency analysis when you have these things that are, again, that you're not quite sure where one letter starts and another, and another letter ends. Um, we do know when it was sent. Maybe that first thing says Lizzie. Maybe it says something else. Um, and then this thing at the very top left, it's underlined multiple times, it's underlined, like this is the key, or this is the subject, and we don't know, but underlined twice. So there seems to be some importance to it. Maybe it's done phonetic. There were other cycles that were done around that time, like short map, for example, is a phonetic language, maybe, but we haven't figured anything out that way. Um, we're so sure that it's possible to be solved that we even hit it on the cover of our book. So if you look on the cover very, very faintly, we put the Luton, we put the Luton cipher there. 
hoping that maybe somebody will see it and oh i've seen this before or, oh yeah i can decrypt this but no luck so far so this remains an unsolved crypto mystery all right now we're going to go to encrypt we know this one is solvable because it was designed with the intent of being solved So in Australia, we're now going south of the equator here in Canberra, they were having a, an anniversary of Canberra. And at the Science Museum in Questacon, there was this sculpture that was installed outside of the uh, Science Museum. These pillars were put there. And the designer is on the left there, that's Stuart Colhagen. You might think of him as the Australian Jim Sanborn uh, designing this uh, thing encrypted sculpture, and he's standing there next to one of the uh, ministers that was sponsoring this uh, anniversary. And this is uh, Glenn McIntosh. He's the Australian fan expert about Encrypt, so he has a huge fan website about it, and he won an award early on uh, for solving part of it, but most of it is not yet solved. So again, we have eight pillars. This is looking from the top down. And they are of different heights. And we know that there are at least 16 messages, 16 cryptograms on these pillars. Only about six of them have been solved so far. Now, one of them, if you were, I wish I had a video of this, if you were to take hold of the rings, you would be able to turn the rings that were on this particular pillar. So, it's fairly clear that this is representing Enigma and the rings on an Enigma machine. People have charted out where the different letters go. And this is one that has been solved. So the pillar has a one part that is narrower than other parts. And this is representing a type of system called a scatale, where someone would, and this goes, this is very old, it goes back thousands of years, where someone would take a, a stick and then they would wrap a piece of leather around the stick, write a message on the piece of leather, and then unwrap it and send just the leather. So the person at the other end would have to have a stick of the same diameter in order to be able to wrap the leather around that stick in order to be able to read the message. Now granted, it's not super difficult to crack this kind of cipher, but at the time, most people aren't, aren't able to read anyway. So it was, it was one type of encryption system that was used. Um, and so we've been able to decrypt that particular message. And but then there's another part. Uh, here, here's one that we haven't been able to crack. So there's these letters that are carved into the pillar. And there's these dots at the end of each letter. And some of the letters are larger than the other letters. We call it the PLV cryptogram because all of the P's, L's, and V's are just a little bit larger than all the other letters. Now, we've talked to Stuart about this, um, and because we were writing a book, we want us to give people a hint, you know, we're saying give people a hint, say give us a hint <laughs> about how to crack these messages. And he has said, that the messages need to be solved in a particular order, and that this is one of the ones that's going to be solved towards the end. That's what they tell us. But we know that everything there was intended to be solved. So if somebody wants to give a shot at it, please, please, please. And just very briefly, I'll go over a couple others. Um, this is in Kaliningrad. There was a bottle with a message that was found. Uh, there was uh, some construction being done. And near this area, a bottle was found with this message in it. So it looks like what we would call a Cold War dead drop, like a spy had written a message, put in a bottle, hidden it somewhere so that someone else could come along and find it. Uh, and it just never got picked up until it was found with this construction. Uh, this area around Kaliningrad was uh, very ripe for anything to do with spies. There, were, there was a submarine base and, and lots of other things going on around there. Um, but it's out there, unsolved message. 
Uh, this is from uh, going back to the early 1900s. There was this private detective named Ignatius Bolaki, and he was one of the first private detectives. Some people say he was actually the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. And he would publish encrypted ads in the newspapers. And I know this because he would sign them, Bolaki. I think you have to put your name in the address at the end of the classified ad. But the beginning of it would be encrypted, like midnight visitor, turkeys are in gangs, eagles fly alone. We don't know. And he did several like this, signed with his name. There may have been others that were not signed by him. Some of them used these characters at the bottom that weren't even uh, the Latin alphabet, but again, signed Malachi. So these two remain very intriguing, unsolved crypto messages. And I have to mention the Voynich Manuscript, one of the most famous encrypted manuscripts in the world. We've radiocarbon dated the paper, which goes back to the early 1400s. Doesn't necessarily mean it was written in the early 1400s, it's the paper was in the early 1400s. It may have been written much later than that. We don't know. There's hundreds of pages, there's hundreds of uh, pictures of plants that we can't really identify. Uh, it's, it's just a big mess of mystery. This script is one, again, that is not used anywhere else. There's, there's no country that uses that language. It's a big mystery. So, conclusion here, and there's many, many others. There's hundreds of encrypted messages waiting to be solved. Um, if you want to try solving one of these, there's a great website called Mystery Twister. And if you go there, people will upload messages, either known encrypted messages, or maybe just someone creates their own message that they want to see if someone can solve. And then they will list these messages by the number of solves. So if you want to try something that's easy, look for something that's been solved many, many, many times. Or if you want to try something that's difficult, try something that's that's never been solved. You can sort them. They're all kind of changing the website, but when we got this uh, few days ago, uh, you could say you wanted it by level so level one would mean something that has been solved many times, and level X might be unsolved as you know. And um, that's it. I will say that I have two more crypto talks coming up here at DragonCon. Tomorrow I will be speaking on Crypto 101, how to crack messages. So I'll be going into some of these techniques uh, in a, a deeper dive. And then what I was saying about the Zodiac Killer and Mary Queen of Scots, I'll be going into those on Monday. And other than that, thank you very much. Any questions? We have a microphone. Uh, could you uh, line up and get and get the mic? Yeah. Here? Run, run. Hi. About. Okay. Uh, can we bring up the mic, please? Yes. You take it. Okay. No, I give you this one, but then I need. <laughs> If you want, just just say it, and I'll. I can, I can just say. It. All right, about um, cryptos. Um, cryptos. Ed Scheidt, he was the cryptographer. Ed Scheidt, yep. And Jim Sander, uh, I don't know. Jim Sanborn and Ed Scheidt. And they made it. Uh -huh. What type of uh, computer electronic tools? Would Evshite have had access to at that time? And could this be done without CIA tools, or did he do it by himself? What do you think? It's a great question. Um, what kind of computer tools would Evshite have had available to him um, and could have solved with or without those tools? Um, this was in the 90s, so there were plenty of computer tools that were available at the time, and Evshite would design other ciphers. This wasn't the first time he designed a cipher. What I found out about him was that he was uh, someone who would run various spy agencies in different parts of the world. Uh, I, there was one place where he mentioned, he says he was the last one out and he closed the vault, something like that was, so yeah, he, he was running things. And, um, but he would design things in a way that if someone 
an agent needed help, they could say some sort of message that would then be communicated somewhere. So he said that he and, and Sam Warren did discuss how difficult to make the ciphers on cryptos, and they wanted it to be something that could be solved, pencil paper. They'd also discuss whether it should be in English or it could be in Assyrian or something really difficult, but no, they wanted it to be in English. But they did say that they removed the advantages of the English language for part four, meaning that, and he said this a couple times, that we had the advantages of English for parts one through three, meaning that we could look for double letters and vowels and frequency analysis, but that that was removed for part four. And he has says he has said that he used a little bit of stego, a little bit of steganography for part four. Steganography being hiding a message in such a way that it's not entirely clear that there is a message. Um, I've also pushed Ed quite a bit. Like, I've taken these guys out drinking. I've bought them <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and everything you can imagine. And, and I've asked him a couple times, is it solvable? Is it possible that Jim just screwed it up? And Ed at one point said, I'm good, it's done right. So does Ed know what part four says? That's another big question. And he will not say for sure if he knows, if he knows the answer, he does not. Uh, Sam Borton has said he's the only person that knows the answer, which is a big concern for me because I was a game developer. And one of the most common things that will happen when you have a new game developer is they'll design a puzzle which is obvious to them, but is not solvable because they, they've done something dumb in it. But um, he says he's checked it. I've asked him, could he describe part four well enough to Ed that Ed could solve it? Which Jim has said, I don't know. Hmm. And he's also said that he, how do I, I'm trying to remember his exact wording, he's called himself an anamath, meaning he's not a mathematician. Uh, and so when people try to describe things and say, well, did you do this where you doubled that? And if we, and he says, no, 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 I, he doesn't want to know the math. That's not the way that he makes codes. So anyway, I could go on for quite a bit. Thank you for this. Okay. Uh, do you have an opinion on the uh, Voigt manuscripts? I mean, it seems like it might be a, a hoax, if not a hoax, uh, just like a farce, you know, somebody made up. Uh, do you have a personal opinion on that? Do I have a personal opinion on the Voynich manuscript? Yes, but it depends which day that you ask. Okay. Uh, so uh, some days I'll tell you that, yes, it's a hoax, uh, that it was designed. Uh, there was a, an emperor around the time, Emperor Rudolf II, who was known to collect curiosities and so perhaps someone created a curiosity to sell to the emperor maybe um, perhaps it was a, an encrypted uh, catalog that a family was using because they wanted to sell uh, herbs and ointments to people this was in the 1400s so it's after, after the plague if you were health conscious and when you're selling an ointment the Right, but the ointment is dependent on the rarity of the herbs that are put in the ointment. So maybe they made this manuscript as a way to show, look at these herbs, far, far away, very difficult to get. Um, so maybe, or maybe it was created by someone who was just schizophrenic and his family. It, whoever made it had means. There, the hundreds of pages of parchment was not cheap at that time. All of the inks not cheap at that time. So somebody had the wealth in order to be able to create it. But other than that, we, we don't know why. There's my opinion. <laughs> That's actually where I was going to start going. Oh, okay. right. but, uh, um, and it's good that you talk about the parts and the expense involved, because if it is a hoax, that guy was already in a wealthy environment. Yeah. You know, to then hoax the king or whoever, the queen or whoever it was. So it wouldn't make sense that way. But then my segue was going to be, what do you think about Sakata? Uh, what do I think about the cicada code? The uh, you heard about the online cicada, yeah. It, yeah. Some people call it maybe a hoax, or maybe it's actually a recruitment mechanism. Oh, cicada, cicada 3301. Ah, cicada, another one that I could talk about for quite a while. 
My opinion on Sakata is that it was created by a bunch of people on 4chan, a bunch of people giggling in a chat room. So oh, okay. that's my opinion on Sakata. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah, come on out. What What would you say makes a uh, cryptid the most difficult to, to crack? Like, if you're looking at creating your own cryptid, what would you say would be the part that you would look at as being like, well, okay, what makes a, a code difficult to crack? Yes. Someone's going to create a code? Uh, okay, so it, I, it would depend which direction they're coming at, meaning they're generally a code is something that's going to be used in wartime. So someone's creating a message and they're sending it to someone else. They want it to be something that can be decrypted there in wartime conditions. So bombs are going blowing off and and then someone can reply in that same thing. So message created, sent, decrypted. Message created, sent, decrypted. Uh, so that's one way of looking at a code. Another way of looking at a code is for recreation. Someone wants to create something, then they want to see if someone else can crack what they made. Which child are we talking about? Uh, the second. The second. Um, uh, you can sit down and write a bunch of random characters and say it's a code, but uh, I wouldn't say that that's a fair challenge. If you want to make something that you think is solvable, I would start by looking at other challenges. I would solve a bunch of other challenges. So the, the ACA, the American Cryptogram Association, this is what they do. They create messages every month. They send out newsletters. Um, and uh, then you try and solve, you get points for solving them, and then once a year they have an association meeting. Their, their next meeting is actually coming up at the end of September, uh, and they have a challenge also at the meeting where um, they sit, set aside a couple hours where people try and solve messages and get prizes. Um, so to make it difficult, you want to figure out what kind of method it is, is what I would say. What kind of method do you want to use? Mm -hmm. For cryptos, since it's like a 3D sculpture, has anyone looked at it, like the, the clues talk about light and stuff like that, has anyone looked at it like this is 3D, what about, you know, like the, the shadows on it? And like a certain time period and looking like maybe there's only certain things that are eliminated, and like that's your actual code? So the, the question is about cryptos. Has anyone looked at it in terms of the lights and shadows? Um, yes, we've actually been trying to make a 3D model of the sculpture and then look at it at different times of the day, different times of the year. Um, but we haven't found anything that would be applicable to a code. Not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying we have, like, say you're looking at it on the solstice and the shadows are in such and such a way. How to say, okay, we see it now. How do we use that? And we haven't figured anything out. So it's a good idea, though. And anyone who wants to join our group, there's there's a couple of cryptos groups. There's one on Facebook. Uh, there's another one at uh, groups.io. And come on in. Come on in. Could you back up to the... What? Cryptos? The, the, the mystery solving. What do you have? The URL. Yeah. Ah, ah, okay. Um, so what about? So this is codebreaking-guide.com. Yeah, I, I didn't get that in URL. Okay. Yeah, this one? Yeah. Okay. And also if you go to elanka.com, it's a lot there. Can you click it? But oh. click it so we can see the it will screen or bigger, that blue. Yeah, double click where you are right now. Double click. Oh, okay. Got it. Go go back two slides, please. Uh, MysteryTwister.org. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, how did you become a code breaker? Uh, and. Obviously, this is a hobby for a lot of people. How do people attack this and want to do it for cuts? Oh, gosh. I, I became, how did I become a code breaker? Um, I've just always been interested in it since I was a kid. Um, my father's a mathematician, and I come from a long line of mathematicians. I think that's part of it as well. 
uh, someone who wants to become a professional code breaker, study math, uh, and see if you can get a job at the NSA. <laughs> and even if you don't get a job at the NSA, still study math because often they do uh, swap programs with uh, teachers that can come in and work with the NSA for six months and then go back to their uh, academic job. So they're very, very open about uh, sharing information, different ways of doing things. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, I uh, I don't know if you have the time or the inclination, but I think the last time you were at DragonCon, I saw your talk and you described how you got in to see cryptos for the first time. Would uh -huh. you be willing to sort of like describe that? How I got in to see cryptos yeah. the first time? Um, with the big guys with guns and the barbed yeah. wire and all that? Well, the, the whole thing about sort of having to be invited in or something, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, the yeah. first time, yeah, the first time I got in to see cryptos, uh, I needed to be invited because it's very efficient and so uh, And I got in because I was speaking at a hacker con called DEF CON in Las Vegas, and I was speaking about steganography and what kind of codes that Al-Qaeda was using. And... Uh, I used that the loss shorter. I used that talk with the official business got me in to CIA, and uh, they invited me to speak there. And I said, oh, "I'll come in to speak, but only if I get to spend some time with my parents." And that was the first visit. And then the second visit was uh, a uh, a news agency was doing a special, and they were going in to film cryptos, and they brought me in to also film me looking at the. Yeah. Um, regarding the cryptos, can you say, hey, read that as something about the coordinates of cryptos? Um, they point to in that green uh, cafeteria courtyard area, and they point to another spot in that courtyard, but it doesn't appear to be anything interesting there. Um, yeah. you like yeah. I have been there. I mean, we have that spot. Yeah. And uh, there are lunch tables that I dragged around. Um, and the only thing we can figure is that, uh, and sorry, I don't have the slide here, but that Sam also made some sculptures outside the front of the agency and they're kind of at a diagonal. And so if you take those coordinates and line them up with cryptos, it's like a parallel like a quadrilateral thing going on, and we think that was what we might have intended. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in one of your slides, you showed, I think it was a love note from some guy named Gio. The love note? Okay. And, um, you mentioned that, like, so the love is looking like they were on different planes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was wondering, has anyone looked at that as, like, maybe accents or die credit? I said when, okay, so we're talking about the Luton postcard, the one that I've got uh, on the front here. Has anyone looked at them as they may be accents or diacritics? Or like in Arabic, you've got the vowel supplants that have done that. We have, but maybe we haven't looked at it the right way. So it, it's a good idea. And anyone who's got a good idea, take it, run with it, and maybe you'll find something we haven't. Okay, yep. What, what do you say if someone who had, like, they claim to be, like, unlimited computational power? Like, how quickly does a code uh, become unfeasible? Like, if you want to try and, like, uh, break it down. Okay, if someone has unlimited computing power. Like, how hard is it to break a, 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 a like, code down? Like, so it, it depends on the kind of code that it is. Um, and again, this is something that I'll probably be talking more about in, in one of the other presentations. There's a technique called hill climbing that can be used, uh, and some kinds of codes will follow quickly. Uh, and we have this thing also where you're, you're rating things on the, the correctness scale. So uh, maybe you'll have something where you're looking for vowels and you can tell quickly if something has a lot of vowels. Maybe that won't help at all. And then you need to start looking at what's called diagrams. So 
in English, you'll find a lot of uh, double things that would be a TH, lots of THs, not so many QXs. And so those kinds of things would be the kinds of things in the room. I'm not sure if that's an answer to your question. Okay. Five minutes. Okay. Last one, of course, in the last years we've seen the rise of AI, chat, GPT, and everything. And just kind of wondering, in your opinion, how long before chat, GPT, or something can break cryptos? Uh -huh. yeah. AI and chat, GPT, breaking cryptos. Um, I'm going to give a, a long raspberry on that. <laughs> <laughs> because chat, GPT is a wonderful LLF, large language model. Wonderful. Cannot count. You cannot count. I went to Chat GPT and said, give me a 97 letter sentence that has the word Berlin, but this, like, can't do it. Can't do it. So give me a 97 letter sentence. Can't do it. Can't do it. I, I asked it five times to do a 97 letter sentence. It gave me different sentences at different lengths all the way through. It's not made to count it yet. Yet. If someone may, I'm sure someone can write a program that would say generate 97 letter sentences that have for Berlin, not cloud, or, you know, but, but so far, no, AI is, a, AI is not AI. I go to Google and I type in the word peach and it showed me peach trees. Oh, that's AI. Oh, no, that's not really AI. That's a search engine. So, um, yeah, big long raster. Right. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I feel like somebody is with, uh, like, do you feel like a side door is something we can't break until you figure out how they're done? Whereas the other ones with a 56 AES are dark and the everyday internet uses. You know, a structure, so we know that was not computing power that could be broken. So some ciphers aren't cryptography like this. We just don't know the structure. It doesn't matter how much computing power you have. It's, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, it's, like, yeah, like it, right. So like if you go to an ATM and you put in your bank card to an AM, the ATM kind of encryption that's used there is completely different from the stuff I'm talking about here with classical ciphers. Um, and the kind of cryptanalysis that is done for modern ciphers is completely different. Because, um, say, with a modern system, you're going to say, okay, we're going to create uh, an encrypted sentence that, I don't know, 500 characters long, and then see if we can decrypt it from there, so, which is completely different from here with a classical cipher, where you've got this thing that you're not even sure you can read it, okay? It because, power. Right, right. Yeah. One, well, it doesn't matter how much computer power you throw at. We don't know what right. True. Okay. Do you think that anybody has solved pay for and not been public about it, say within one of the agencies or a group and it has not been made public? And if so, would that make it less any less intriguing to solve? And so and, and that's a question I get a lot. Do, do I think that someone may have solved K4, like in one of the intelligence agencies, and they just haven't told anybody? Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I know enough people in the intelligence agency that if it had happened, at some point somebody would have come and like, hey, how are you doing on K4? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's possible, but no, I don't think it's been like somebody saw and dropped it in a drawer. No, I don't think so. Okay. All right. If anybody wants a book, they're here. <laughs> Thank you.